I'm Ryan Ford. I am currently working as VP of Design at Crackle and now Redbox, um, working on some major transformations in the entertainment industry. And I've been in the design industry uh, for a little over 24 years, going on 25 at this point. Um, so hopefully I have some experience and wealth of knowledge to, to speak from. And thank you so much for having me here, Mark. So Ryan, why don't we start with just some lang getting our language straight. When you say designer, I hear five different jobs that go with that. What for today's conversation, what do you mean by designer? So what I'm referring to when I talk about designers, and I'm definitely guilty of just using that as a blanket term, um, I, I'm typically referring to product designers, or maybe I should say digital product designers who work in software, building applications and tools in sort of a computer software phone environment, um, and not speaking about specifically graphic designers or fashion designers or industrial designers, if that helps clarify. It does. And I think to help people, because I, I know where it is, but I want to help our audience here. Um, there's this notion of user experience and the user interface. So I'm I'm going to guess you're not paying 100% attention to what color a button is or where the button is, but in fact, the user experience. And my get, is that a part of it? Well, well, yes and no. Um, when I talk about a product designer in a digital space, I'm referring to the UI, the UX designers, which are uh, very common terms, but a product designer is sort of both of those things. They're a visual designer, a UI designer, a UX designer. They're concerned with not just how it looks and not just how it works, but also the business impact and the customer impact, understanding research. There's so much more um, in my view and in my experience, it goes into great product design than just those specific things by themselves. So in the piece that you wrote, which we'll, we'll get to the, the part about the Odyssey, you, t you kind of help the reader understand something that's called double diamond and then design thinking. And, and we've had people on the show and, and other shows talking about design thinking designers. I'm obsessed with with how you all think. Um, so tell us um, just real quickly what those are, but then why you felt you needed to disrupt those and come up with something new. So I'll start with Double Diamond. Um, Double Diamond is uh, a working philosophy to describe a way in which design, and, and oftentimes it's applied very generally to design, um, ought to work. And it effectively begins with an understanding of problems, uh, a deep understanding of um, uh, user impact, customer empathy, and then it, it explodes into exploration and playfulness, which I go into in my piece, mm -hmm. and I know we'll talk more about that in a second. And then it converges back into decision-making and ultimately output. Um, and I'll speak to why I think it's problematic in a moment. Uh, but in effect, it's a framework that um, helps guide the practice of design. And I don't want to imply that it's bad in and of itself. My um, articulation of its problems has been in its application. Now, design thinking is, I think, a little bit more abstract even than double diamond. Um, design thinking is really a mental model. It, it is a it is an approach, a philosophy, a way of thinking, hence the name, uh, that encourages all participants to, whether or not they are creative people by, by trade, to um, allow themselves to fail and be creative and explore what might be, rather than jump immediately into solutioneering and problem solving. And much like Double Diamond, it uh, strongly encourages customer user empathy to help guide uh, one's way. Um, and I want to emphasize that it is a mental model, not an instruction manual. And um, uh, several books that have been written about design thinking, and there have been many, but um, one written by, uh, I always get names wrong, so I wrote it down, uh, Tom Kelly from IDEO, and then another written by Tim Brown, also from IDEO, um, they really have inspired this, this wave of appreciation of design thinking and have also built out a cottage industry of people who have effectively defined their careers by their ability to contract and instruct others 
um, on how to practice design thinking. So hopefully that is a long-winded explanation of, of what and I think. IDEO is, is very well known in the design, in the TED community as well, probably. Um, Absolutely. Part, part of the big D thinking, uh, as it turns out. Um, so you have, again, working almost, you know, quarter of a century in this, and, and there are all these different points of view of how to do the work, and then you're actually doing the work. So you, I, lo I love that our job is our lab, and then we can come home and think about how we, how could we make that better? Because you're actually applying this idea of design to design. It's very meta what you're doing, in, in my opinion. Um, so I'm going to jump to the end quickly. When you were mentoring young design students, are you mentoring them in this new disruptive way of thinking? So are you kind of creating uh, 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 an army of new thinkers? I'm trying. <laughs> I, I, I kind of think that's my job, right? Um, uh, I think that, um, yes. I, I mean, when I'm mentoring young designers, it, it the, the topic ranges across a number of different um, uh, concerns, uh, concerns about the way in which they do design. Are they good enough to do design? How do I just get my first design job? As well as um, I've been in design for a long time and I feel like my career is stifled. In fact, I had a mentorship session just yesterday about that very topic. And I have written a medium piece about that, which maybe we'll talk about at some other point. Um, but disruption and new ways of thinking, I think, are inherent and, and meaningful and um, important to being a designer in this day and age in technology. We have to always be challenging the status quo around how we do our work and we have to push for more understanding of how design really works today amongst our peers in other departments and, and businesses, um, uh, product management, engineering, marketing, et cetera. We need them to fully appreciate and understand what we do so that we can, in unison, be much more effective. So that's a perfect, thank you, uh, segue into a question. Um, my friend, Dane Howard, who's a designer, he says that product and service design is often an act of will to get all the stakeholders aligned and pointed in the right direction. What is it? Uh, so I, I, would you agree with that? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. what what is it going to take to to shift things? I mean, I'm I'm guessing you've shifted things at Crackle. You're in a position to to have done that, but, but that feels like a, a lot of work. It is a lot of work, and I think the higher up you go in a design role, the more and more your job becomes storytelling and mm. um, uh, negotiating. Uh, to achieve alignment and like a commonality of, of goals, um, which is of course very challenging. Less and less of the job becomes what does a design look like and more about what are we working towards. Um, now, the challenge I think that your friend was asking about and um, articulating really comes down to uh, sort of a a lack of understanding of how design actually works, hmm. how it's applied, and what it's going to do for the business. Because so many other, so many non-designers within an organization, they they view just the output. They they see right. what comes out of design, and so they think that it is a machine, um, a machine where a request goes in one end and a design comes out the other end. And there's so much more thinking and strategy and research and data collection and trial and error that goes into great design. Um, and we need to help other people understand that. So they, they have an understanding and an appreciation of what we do, what it's gonna to take to get that great end result and how they are a meaningful part of the process all along the way. I've likened design unto, um, it, it's, it feels very front loaded in the sense that all the thinking and hard work and the exploration, I love the way you use the word play uh, in there, but there was there was so much of that done to the point where like now here's the thing that needs to be built. And then there's some iteration in that, but there's so much front loaded in that. And especially with this output oriented, goal oriented uh, uh, management, 
I'm thinking about the relationship you have in the C-suite and what kinds of things, how, how have you found, what story, here's the question, what story have you told that helps them understand the value of continued investment in time and energy in design? The story that I found works really well is to, well, it actually, it, it's not one story. It, it differs from stakeholder to stakeholder. Um, okay. So I understand the inherent value of design, of course. Um, and I think my job is to frame that value in that process in words that uh, are common or familiar to the individual. Mm. Um, so some C-suite members are going to be really motivated by increases in revenue, right? And okay. uh, through the work that we've done at Crackle, and I've done this at other companies as well, I can draw direct lines between the exploratory work we've done, the work we've literally built, and increases in revenue, as well as other KPIs or key performance indicators, things that matter to the business, right? Um, but then there are other members of the C-suite who are, of course, motivated by money and the money that the business can make, but are also very concerned with their own KPIs, their own goals. Mm -hmm. And so I'm able to speak to things that we're thinking about doing in a, an interface design or an experience that will facilitate something like better marketing messaging, better mm -hmm. merchandising of content. Um, this will make their lives a whole lot easier because we've explored, we've done competitive analysis, we've talked to people and we've learned that X, Y, Z is going to be a potential solution to a problem that maybe they weren't even realizing they had. So again, it, it's really helpful to speak in the language of the recipient of the message and not try to like cram my own personally articulated and made up story down their throats because it I've learned it doesn't resonate often. Yeah, if you want to master influence, you have to do exactly what you just said. And it's interesting to use story and um, that understanding how someone's going to receive that story. Because at the end of the day, you want you want to get an outcome that's good for everybody, right? Um, yeah. Did you, do you talk about the role of story with young designers and, and how that's going to be successful for them? Yes, I do. I mean, that, that uh, mentoring session that I referred to about um, uh, the person who was feeling a little stifled in their career, they were, they were wondering, what does it take to grow? What does it take to elevate oneself into bigger and better and more meaningful roles within a design team? And that's one of the things I really focus on is the ability to tell a story. Mm. Um, the stories that we tell are, they, they are the message. Um, it's not enough to just say, we want to do this. We think this would be a good idea. You really have to talk about um, how you came to certain decisions, what you've learned along the way. Uh, you have to bring other people in for the journey and actually treat it like a conversation. And um, you have to include, like I was saying, an understanding of what the recipient of your story cares about. That has to be baked in. So in your in this this new idea, this new way of thinking about design that you've put out um, that you call uh, loosely call the Odyssey. Yeah, I love the way you ended your piece. You said you gave it its name and you said, I wish I had a better name for it, but we'll call it the Odyssey, which is one of the great stories of all time, right? And it is the it is the hero's journey, right? In in that story. Um so why don't you give us for those who who don't know or wanting to learn more, what what's different about this way, if you're setting fire to these other two ideas, not literally, but and saying, here's the, what, what, give us the pros of that. Well, um, let's take a step back and talk about double diamond and design thinking. Um, like I was mentioning a moment ago, they are valuable uh, methodologies in their own right, but they are often misapplied or misunderstood by non-designers as well as designers, especially younger ones, but predominantly by non-designers who will look at a design team working at their company and go, okay, we're engineering or we're product or we're such and such. We have a process. Engineering is a great example of this, by the way. Engineers tend to have a very rigid process, which is all designed to avoid uh, 
you know, bugs that they might create, sure. um, downtime, et cetera, et cetera. And that process is very, very rigid and very well documented. Um, you can literally go buy books that tell you all the steps to running an engineering department successfully, and you can follow them to a T and you'll be good. So these other departments, they look at design and they go, well, where's the design process? So they look up design process online, or they talk to people who have worked in design, and people will talk about double diamond. People will talk about design thinking, and they'll go, oh, isn't that your process? Isn't that what you're supposed to be using? So as a design leader or a member of the design team, which half the time reports to a head of product already, um, they'll sort of feel this pressure, this pressure to adopt double diamond and to follow that as a, as a rigid process when it's not meant to be a rigid process it's meant to be an abstract guide so um, when i'm talking about setting fire to design process i'm talking about that that mentality that double diamond and design mm -hmm. thinking perhaps among many others are rigid uh frameworks processes step-by-step -step guides to follow as crammed down our throats by non-designers and so because these non-design departments are thirsty for some articulation of process, my thinking, my goal in a slightly antagonistic manner, which I am known to be, um, was to create a replacement that is treated, designed, drawn as if it is a step-by-step -step guide, but at the same time, bakes in an appreciation for the fact that so many of these supposed steps are really abstract in and of themselves. They're really obtuse and they often cycle back to one another. You might think you've gotten to um, sort of an end state with your work only to discover something new. Maybe you didn't discover something new. Maybe an executive said, I simply don't like it. And you're not in a position to argue. And you kind of have to go back to the drawing board. Double diamond and design thinking don't really have that drawn in per se. What happens when the executive says, I don't like it? That's not part of those. So I wanted to include more bits of reality in something that somebody could print out on a big piece of paper and stick on the wall and say, that's our design process. Ryan, I, I love that. For those that want to see that picture, we have a link uh, on the show notes. Uh, Ryan, thank you. I, I can't wait to hear more about this.